All right. As I said, welcome everyone to week six of our um, sustainability business and entrepreneurship lecture series. It's my privilege and honor to um, welcome another fantastic Evergreen alum who is doing some incredible um, stuff in this, this nexus of sustainability business and entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, again, it's my honor to welcome Aaron Sauerhoff, CEO and founder of Earth Homes, LLC. Sauerhoff is actively revolutionizing the construction industry with unique building systems, respective to the bioregion for which he designs and builds with his team and network of natural builders and material specialists. Um, so Aaron, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it off to you. I'm going to um, replace my spotlight. And thanks again so much for joining us. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for all for being here. Hey, everyone. My name is Aaron Sauerhoff. I'll get into my story in a bit. There's going to be a lot of content, a lot of information, a lot of high level, nitty gritty. Um, and I want to leave as much time at the end for questions and discussion as possible. Cool. So yeah, today we're going to talk about the importance and the hows of natural building and business. And talk about the industry of climate of the building industry itself. Um, why green? Why we need to shift the building industry and uh, the material manufacturing world? A little bit about my story. Um, I figure I want to throw this in for uh, the relevance of the greener community. Uh, it's really fun and weird. Um, what we've been doing to revolutionize some of the materials and methods to achieve some of these outcomes that are important. And we'll go over some take-homes uh, and we'll wrap it all up and then have good discussion and, um, and get into it. So shelter. Um, I assume a lot of people here have been interested and curious about the just the nature of the housing market. Uh, we all either rent or own. Most of us are renters. Um, looking at the future of you know, the, the socioeconomics and all the, the complexities and intricacies of our, of our real estate and housing and building industries. Um, shelter has become a commodity. And with that have become some really toxic pr practices. Um, there's a really cool quote that I, I wish I jotted down the, uh, the author of it, but ever since land has been, has been considered an asset, people have built housing upon it as quickly as possible and charged others as much as possible to live in it. And this is partly how we got to where we are today. Um, just run through this because it kind of sets the stage. For what I'm going to talk about, the housing market grows exponentially and with outdated technologies that go unconfronted and unchallenged in most places. Uh, code minimum is finally catching up to some of these practices and principles, uh, but are still far from acceptable and where we need to be. So I'll touch on that a little bit as well. So according to the Carbon Leadership Forum, and I'm going to go into a little bit more details on the next few slides. Um, but this is where we start. I want to start with the problem itself. Buildings account for roughly 40% of all energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. That's a lot. And according to Chris Magwood, which I advise if anyone's interested in uh, the carbon impact of our built environment, I would definitely research Chris Magwood's research paper and some of his work out in Ontario, Canada. Um, he talks a lot about, and I'm going to talk about this, the embodied carbon in the materials. And he, he says that it's about half of the building's impact is just spent before anyone even moves in. It's in the materials. It's in the, um, actually, I'll save that. For, there's a slide about that, so I'll save it for then. But we'll refer to that as embodied carbon. It's really important. So a little overview of the problem. <laughs> Quick and cheap. Uh, toxic materials, and that has to do with indoor air quality, um, which are being directly linked to um, health conditions, 
respiratory, autoimmune, cardiovascular. Uh, you know, we breathe, we spend a lot of time inside of our homes. We breathe a lot of, you know, we're breathing this air and there's stuff floating in the air from our uh, furniture, our carpets, our, um, our finishes, our skins in our, in our room. And there's a lot of importance uh, of, of addressing the need for natural materials and, and healthy materials there. So we'll touch on that a little bit more at the end too. Um, and with that, you know, that big topic of misguided and uninformed building science, we've built, uh, you know, we've been under this mindset over the last hundred years or so to let houses breathe. We need to make them leaky so that the air from the outside flows through and ventilates the space. So we don't trap all this moisture and toxic, uh, toxic chemicals in the, in the air that we breathe. So keep the windows open or, or just make the buildings leaky and let the air pour in. And that is a very backwards way of thinking that we've discovered recently. Um, yeah, health problems, short life cycles. I've done a lot of rot repair and tearing down perfectly fine buildings that if they were built properly, if they were built with the right materials, and if there was the appropriate building science applied to it, they would be still last, you know, they would still be standing here today. So the economic impact of that is, you know, the landlord has to pay or at least budget a, an ex, a lot of money to, for maintenance and repairs and life cycle. Um, and that cost gets passed down to the market. So that's a big portion of people's rent when you dive into it is that we're, we're living in cheap boxes that aren't made to last. And then there, you know, then there's the big scale thing and I'll try to not zoom out and zoom in too fast. Um, I'm told I can do that, but as a society, we have a lot of remembering and healing to do. And I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, how can we heal if our nervous systems and our, our background nervous systems are constantly in this like minor state of fight or flight or survival modes. And when we are surrounded by toxic materials and we're breathing in all these VOCs and breathing unhealthy air and also surrounding ourselves with monolithic sharp angled boxes and, you know, a lack of art, lack of biophilic design, et cetera, that is not conducive for healthy healing processes. So that's become a big uh, passion of mine is how to design, you know, remember that as part of the design process, how to design for healing and health or optimal healing and health. So the carbon elephant in the room. So often when we look, you know, when we sit in these city council meetings and agencies that are addressing the carbon impact of our built environment, we're often hearing about operational carbon. They're talking about energy efficiency, they're talking about you know heat pumps, solar, all the things to reduce the operational carbon of our built environment, and that's about half on on average. On average. And just like how money now is more valuable than money later, uh, we can also say that carbon savings now is more valuable and more impactful than carbon savings over the long run. So if you can imagine, you know, uh, standard building only costs this much carbon to build, but it's going to be really energy inefficient. The carbon graph is going to be going to be pretty steep. Okay, well, let's make an energy efficient building, but we're going to use concrete, foam, vinyl, plastic, you know, really toxic, high embodied carbon materials to, to achieve that energy efficiency. We're going to start out with a ton of carbon just to get it built with a short, with, or with a, a shallow graph from there. And when you look, compare those two graphs, uh, it's actually not as much of a savings as you think. And it, it takes quite a few decades to pay that initial carbon investment off. And the impact is, is uh, much higher when you spend it all up front at once. So at some point, as, as a human society, we need, to, we need to achieve zero carbon emissions. We need to stop emitting carbon. So if that's the goal, to, to level ourselves out, one of these things to the right 
needs to be a zero. Now let's run through them and see what's possible there and what's realistic. What let's let's really reorient ourselves to the goals. So population, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but that's probably not going to be zero anytime soon. So let's not uh, rely on that. And let's, let's pass over. Let's pass that. Uh, affluence, you know, the more money per person per year equals more more carbon impact and, and more. You know, ideally, we want more people to have more affluence. More, we we should all be making more money, at least more capital, have more capital in the world. So, I don't believe the answer is to reduce that to zero. Obviously not. Uh, energy intensity. So, how clean our energy is. So, uh, we're working on that as a, as a society. I mean, that's that's definitely on the right track but from what i'm seeing that's going to take a few more decades at least to get anywhere near um zero um and then carbon intensity so this is about how this is this is talking about car embodied carbon of the materials we use how much carbon is spent to produce and install a building or our things physical things in our world and that can be zero. And we'll talk about that in a bit. That's actually what I what I'd say is the low hanging fruit of, of this whole picture. That's, in my opinion, the easiest thing to tackle. Let's clean up the materials. Let's let's reorient our perspective and our view of the materials we're using so that we can bring that to zero. And we can. So um, a great plug. Well, uh, there's a great organization out of UW called the Carbon Leadership Forum. Um, I highly recommend if anyone's interested in this topic further, diving into this, this data and statistics and the solutions and the tool sets and the policy toolkits. There's a lot of really good stuff. On, if you just Google the Carbon Leadership Forum, this is straight from their page and it, and it breaks up this, this, um, this topic of operational carbon versus embodied carbon. So on the right, this graphic just kind of shows embodied carbon in a nutshell. So we have the whole, we try to calculate the entire life cycle of the materials we're using. So from raw material to, uh, you know, mining, processing, transportation, manufacturing, more transportation, construction, uh, re then we have use and maintenance repair, and then end of life cycle. Where does it go? How reusable is it? Uh, what happens to it in the landfill, et cetera. Um, there are now, um, there are now easy tools that we have at our disposal, uh, disposal to calculate the embodied carbon of the materials we're using. So you asked me five years ago, or ask anyone five years ago, they said, oh, you know, we don't really have the, the right tools or the data to calculate our, our actual impact of the materials. Well, they can't say that anymore. We have three powerful tools, such as the EC3, the BEAM tool, uh, and there's a few others um, that are pretty straightforward, really simple. I use them for a lot of different firms. I help people do this work. It's not hard. Um, and those take, in a nutshell, that takes the EPDs. I think it stands for environmental something declaration. Um, but every material should have, and it's not hard for them to produce an EPD. And that shows, you know, how much carbon it costs to produce said volume of material, whether it's drywall, concrete, uh, EPS foam, XPS foam. Um, I mean, when you look at concrete it's, itself, there's hundreds and hundreds, I think thousands actually of different uh, sources of concrete, some ranging from a 180 tons per yard to, to 400 tons per yard. So it's with varying amounts of carbon per material. And so it's it's important to to be aware of this and measure because you can't manage what you don't measure. So we have to start measuring the problem. That's that's number one. So now that I've outlined the outlined the problem in a nutshell, um, let me do a quick little story time share my story, how I got here. 
So in, um, and this is going to, I think this could be really valuable for some people because, you know, Evergreen is a place where we come looking for alternative paths. It, you know, it's not the kind of place where we're like, all right, here's the, here's this degree path set in stone. I know exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, no, we, oftentimes we come here because we've identified a set of problems. Great. That's really, I think, rare in the world and really needed is that is, that is the traditional, you know, beginning of, of the hero journey, I think, of, uh, of figuring out how to, how to solve those problems. What does that take? And oftentimes it's not a straightforward path. So for me, here was how this happened. In 2014, I had a, a journey in New York. Um, had a really profound experience in Manhattan and couldn't see the world the same way anymore. And it was about the built environment. For me, that was the theme. And I very clearly saw that there was a relationship between how we design and how we build and the people that then inhabit that container and how, and how then we get shaped by that container just staring me blaringly obvious in the face it was like oh okay we become products of our container got it so saw that there was a relationship a source of a problem that then led to a bunch of different problems in our culture and our society our how we relate to each other how we how we yeah it went deep so and then i started exploring well what are the solutions what let me let me look into this problem a little deeper, I became obsessed with alternative ways of designing and building. I just was obsessively researching earth ships, cob, straw bale, hempcrete, um, and all the natural building systems. And I just kept asking, well, how have we been building for the last 10, 20,000 years all over the world? How have different biomes and different cultures been solving these problems of shelter, warmth, air quality, uh, mater healthy material management, labor, uh, labor management. Um, how were those things being managed all this time? And why did it change in the, during the Industrial Revolution? And what have we forgotten since then? So with those questions, I traveled a little bit. I went to Portugal, I went to Australia, I went to um, the New Mexico area, and I just started seeking out some elders, seeking out the people trying to bring back natural building practices. Um, and with that, I started seeing a vision of something, whether a network, a platform, a game platform, you know, game platform, maybe um, some entity structure thing that could be big enough to tackle the systems of power in the in the uh, housing industry which is huge and very dominated by the people that have been in power in that world for a long time um so how can we create something resilient enough big enough um and um, and connected and, and accessible and healthy enough to bring forth the traditional ways of building using regenerative, healthy, localized natural materials respective to the biomes in which we're, we're talking about, and basically bring these, bring these systems to the mainstream a little bit more and make them accessible to the average person with an average budget budget and then try to push the, the the economic spectrum down a little bit how do we how do we bring that then further down into the people that need affordable housing and and, and just go from there you know there's a big big need there um so then i set my sights on the pacific northwest for some reason the map when i was looking at the map olympia was just sticking out to me so I moved out to Olympia 
um, with my partner at the time, we were living on Long Island and um, just kind of went, winged it. We, we packed up our car, drove out and on the way applied to Evergreen <laughs> um, because the family was like, well, you need to go to school. You need to do something. Uh, so that was, that was my excuse for, for moving out to the family. So um, one of the things that really attracted me about Evergreen was the student activities um, structure, how students can start a student group pretty simply and easily, um, a, put together a good pl set of plans and proposals, apply for the funding. And it seemed like there was a lot of flexibility. And sure enough, there was, at least when we were uh, trying to do what we did. So I started getting my hands in the mud, quite literally. Um, I started finding the, the, I did a few things. I started finding the people that were doing the work, that were bringing back natural building and building natural housing, at, you know, trying to do it at scale. A lot of them former greeners from the late 90s and early 2000s and um, so I started just volunteering for them, showing up to as many work parties as possible, um, showing up to political things, just networking and getting to know people. Um, and at the same time, getting with the, with the start of our student group, the natural building student group at Evergreen uh, called DIG, D-I-G, um, we started getting, <laughs> we started just tabling and laying out some tarps on Red Square at the farmer's market, uh, or the uh, organic farm. Um, Harvest Fest was a, was a fun yearly thing we would, start, we would do. We would just lay out uh, tarps, pour out some materials, get the kids involved, get the kids of all ages involved to mix up materials, and then get people to start sculpting and building and just connecting with the natural materials and realizing that we don't have to rely on other people to do this we can be a little bit more involved in the process building our homes does not have to be an inaccessible thing we can do that so started going down that path that was really fun and then um from there i was getting ready to graduate this was after the shenanigans of 2016 uh campus dynamics were totally different um it was a little bit more hostile um, it wasn't quite the same after that for a while. Um, and so, and with that, there was the school, the student activities uh, world was getting a little more strict on our liability and our paperwork. And, you know, we were doing a lot of, uh, you know, we had a deal with RAD, the work, the wood shop at RAD, and we would, we would ha have little open houses there, intro to framing, intro to, you know, carpentry how to use tools, how to use tape measure. We were just getting people involved. It was really fun. Building small little lending libraries, miniature houses, lots of fun. So at the end of this, we started saying, all right, well, how do we, how do, we do this on our own? Let's just pick up, let's, let's just take ourselves and what we've learned. And you know, I had a lot of tools because I was also working uh, for a traditional contracting company tearing apart houses, redoing a lot of remodels and rot repair and traditional contracting and carpentry work. So I had a ton of tools. Um, so I was like, you know what, let's just start our own contracting company. Um, that was, that was the next step in my, in my master plan was to like start a little contracting company and eventually turn it into a worker owned co-op. Um, so I'll get there. So we started doing this at scale. We started uh, through word of mouth and a little bit of advertising, uh, started doing some feature walls, uh, some simple fun carpentry. There were a lot of, uh, you know, we were connecting with students from the workshop, the wood shop, um, and just connecting them with clients that needed good work. Um, started doing some bathrooms. That's a, na a natural finish on a bathroom. It's lime plaster, uh, some kitchens. Started just doing some plaster work. We had a little plaster crew. Um, and then we started doing big things. Um, we started just, you know, the scale of our projects got bigger and bigger. Um, this is a house in Port Townsend. It's lots of fun. Um, we didn't build the whole house, but we did, you know, parts of it, the natural, some of the natural systems here. 
Um, and then in 2020, things really took off. We took on this big project. The city, all right, so the city of Olympia came to us and said, hey, you know, we've been hearing you for a few years talk about these ideas. You've been really a strong advocate for um, housing accessibility and affordability and homelessness response. And, you know, we've been hearing you. And we, so we have this problem we're at the mitigation site downtown. We have a hundred and something tents on our city owned parking lot. And it's been kind of an experiment. And last winter didn't go so well when it snowed, a bunch of uh, tents caved in, some people died. It's a big problem. So I said, tents are obviously not the solution to stabilize people and get them off the street and get them connected to case management or not, not allowing to rest and, and, and get on some kind of right track, whatever it is for that, whatever that is for them. So, so they're like, we need something, we need, we need units that are bigger or better than tents is the <laughs> words they use. I was like, all right, well, with a budget of only 1200 per unit, that's, that's not a lot. That's maybe enough for materials if you're talking about plywood boxes you know around some simple studs without insulation and soundproofing and air tightness and the things that i know are, are important so i said all right give me a, a budget for one more staff person so that they can fundraise they can go to the material suppliers and and uh you know request donations they can solicit help from these from these manufacturers get them involved so we did. Uh, we got a small crew. We designed this sweet system. We partnered with the Port of Olympia to set up shop in their in their warehouse. We got the um, the local longshoremen union involved to help build some some of these units. We built these jigs and templates and cranes and four ton squisher you see in the top right to make our own sit panels. Um, and we very quickly cranked out 65 micro shelters in about three months, in, including install and delivery. So that was a hell of a fun project, and it turned into this. That was a lot of fun. We had a lot of news coverage. Um, and from there, people started reaching out about a lot of different things, um, projects around Seattle, Portland, Arizona, California. Um, Alaska, um, Detroit. I mean, people were, we were talking with LA for a little bit about their homelessness response. Um, so that was, that was a fascinating journey. I won't go down that too long, but started doing a lot of that work. Um, and then um, we built, you know, after a few houses, we, we, we at the end, at uh, about this time last year, was our last, we finished our last house that we built ourselves as a company. Um, and we split up. Um, I was realizing that I was amongst a community of natural builders. Um, and all of us were trying our best to focus on the builds, the work, the site, the team, how to, how to have healthy team dynamics and do the projects really well and execute the projects well. Um, but not really set up ideally for or um, had the capacity for handling the influx of people, clients reaching out, um, looking to build their dream house and how to vet these clients, how to take them then through the, the, a good, healthy, comprehensive design process, how to get their projects and their visions into plans and permits and, and you know, engineered and all that. So I was noticing that our whole community of natural builders was struggling with this process. And I'm like, you know what? That's actually what I'm really good at. That's what I'd rather be doing. I had a team of project managers and carpenters and this whole, this whole thing that I built. And I was like, you know what? We had a big um, dinner and meeting. We we're like, hey, how do we feel about, like, would we want to just split up into a bunch of groups? Who would want to be their own contracting company and team? Who would want to have, you know, be their own thing? and still be part of a network. Um, and so I had a few project managers raise their hand and that's what we did, we split up. Um, so now my company is now just a, you know, a cog in the machine, I guess. It, it, we provide a service of design, plan, uh, project planning and project management from a consulting and uh, logistical standpoint.
Uh, and that's really fun. We do a lot of the design work for many other natural building contracting companies, other architecture firms that want to use more natural materials and move, shift the needle um, in the right direction, how to tackle some of these low hanging uh, climate goals, um, you know, for car embodied carbon sequestering opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So we're doing a lot of that kind of work now um, and designing some really kick-ass houses. So um, this is just like a little snapshot of some of my design process right now. This is, um, and something that I find really important in the design process is to make it more accessible to the client itself. It's not something where, you know, we're just drawing by hand and you tell me what you want. And then I go and spend a week on my drafting table and come back to you with the ideas where it's very collaborative, very engaging, uh, real time process that people, you know, the clients can sketch directly on the screen. We can click on a thing in one view and it highlights in all the other views. Um, it's a fun, it's a fun process. Here's another project that I just finished. So it's very, you know, we have a 3D walkthrough inside, uh, 3D exterior things, every, and it's all linked. It's a whole building information modeling software called Revit that is just awesome to use and really streamlined, accessible, engaging, fun, um, and has plugins directly to rendering software, like a game platform that I use to produce some really fun, high quality renderings. Um, so this is really fun. We get to, you know, I get to talk about and and inform uh, pros and cons for different material choices. And, and this is where the, the real impact of my work starts to come in. Um, you know, do we hear your goals to achieve these energy efficiency performo standards? You know, we here are some options that I see. Here's some pros and cons to each. Um, how important is environmental impact to you. And that's one of the first questions I ask in the beginning. If, if environmental impact is not a concern, then they're not going to be my client. That's just straight up not, uh, people aren't reaching out to us for any other reason. Like we want a natural home. We want, we, we because, you know, we are reaching out because we've cared. We've learned about embodied carbon. We learned about the toxicity of our built environment. You know, we have a, a relative uh, and my father has terminal cancer. It's a true story. Um, and he, you know, only has a few years left. And we want to build a natural house to make that the last few years as peaceful and healthy and uh, biophilic as possible. Like, cool. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Let's do it. So um, next is, you know, bigger projects. Uh, I just gave a keynote speech at the Thurston Chamber Green, Green Business Expo and Forum something. Um, and after that, a, a small line of people waiting to talk to me, bringing opportunities you know, from Texas to New York, uh, people wanting to build big developments, but they, and they care. They're, you know, they're people with a lot of money, but, and they care about the right things. And they're looking for, a menu of solutions. Like, what are the what are the solutions that achieves these goals? Like, great. Here's my here's my process. Here's my contract. Hire, bring me on as, into the team as a consultant, and and we'll talk. And I'll give them a little preview, a snapshot, to, to show that I'm not an idiot and I know what I'm talking about, and I can actually deliver on that. And it goes well. It's fun, and my impact is huge because the project team, the architecture team, the designers, they're they're doing the the heavy lifting work. Um, but I'm in a position of power to, uh, to inform and, um, and shift the, shift the direction of the planning, planning process early enough where it makes a big, big difference. I kind of point it in the right direction, present a few options and help them achieve what that, you know, help them achieve that. Um, provide resources, connections. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. It's, it's working. Um, so I'm on a mission to scale this kind of process up 
because um, I think I think the number was two percent. Um, could be. Don't quote me on this, but the the current research that I was the most recent research that I was looking at was showing that if two percent of the buildings that that we are building per year, if we shift two percent of of our buildings to carbon sequestering buildings using natural materials and next few slides will go into this a little bit more. Um, but if we shift just 2% of our, of our built environment to the right solutions, I'll say that way, um, then all of a sudden we are not just flattening the, the carbon graph, but starting to shift it in a downward direction. We'll be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it into our buildings and healing in the process. Um, taking a moment, taking a deep breath with all that so far. Fun story. That's where I'm at now. That's how I got here. Um, and I'll, I'll transition with little words, uh, reminder words. Design shouldn't have to take a backseat to sustainability and making things responsibly. Thank you, Amber. Um, a recent poll showed that about 90 or 89% of people uh, surveyed are concerned about their home's environmental impact. That to me is important because it speaks to the market, the market demand. You know, people early on would ask me, well, Aaron, is there a market for this? Are you talking about beautiful things, natural materials, but is there a market for this? Do people actually want this? Of course people want this. Why not? Ever, I, I've never met anyone who doesn't. The question is, the question is, does it pencil out? Does, can we make this? Is it feasible? Is it? Uh, are the people doing the work able to do it uh, in a time frame required to make it feasible economically? You know, those are the kinds of questions that really matter. But of course, people want it. So we have to figure out how to make it feasible, and we have. One of the things that that takes is um, offsite construction. So our plan ultimately uh, in the grand scheme of things is to, and it, this is not just my plan. This is like, who else has this vision? And I want to, I'm, I'm here to support and help and be connected with the other people with this, with this goal and vision is to illuminate the demand and be the supply as a network. I mean, that, that should be the goal of the network because there's an enormous number of people doing this kind of work in silos, in, as individuals, as, as small contracting companies, not in collaboration, not working together, not sharing ideas and resources and opportunities, not joining forces to, you know, form project teams. This is where the collaboration really is impactful. The scale can go, can exponentially increase. The scale of your impact can increase when we start joining forces and working together. Offsite construction, pre-manufacturing. This is the key to making natural materials, carbon sequestering materials, accessible and affordable. Because I've learned that most contractors, when you, when you ask them to stack some straw bales, they're going to say, oh, yeah, funny. Find someone else to do that. We're not, we've never done anything. We have no idea what we're doing. Okay, well, but if you ask them to crane this thing into position and, and screw pieces of wood together and you provide them the right assembly manual and, and you know, which we have, um, and they say, oh, yeah, we can do that. We can you know, bring on a crane and receive a, ship, a, tr a few truckloads of these panels and put the house together. No problem. Um, actually, I want to back up because there's one more thing about this that's really important. Because this, the factory, one of the things we learned about the, um, the micro housing project in, in Olympia was when we created that employment program, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we created an employment program for the folks living at the mitigation site. And that was what we directed all 100% of our labor budget towards, was paying people 
that were living in tents to operate the factory that we designed to be brain proof and accessible for anyone, you know, transitioning or transitioning off of any substances or uh, with no experience from the street, anyone from, you know, any volunteer that wants to plug in. So making a, uh, a factory process that's accessible is a really interesting opportunity to uh, solve some big socioeconomic labor challenges in our world. Um, that's a big one. Um, and then you can get into uh, how we grow our, the biomass that we use in these panels. If you have enough kind of impact and power in this, in this, in this sphere, you can say, Hey, farmers, we actually are only going to accept straw or, or hemp or, or any other bast fiber, um, that is grown to these standards, which is a carbon sequestering standard. If you have toxic uh, agricultural practices, uh, you're actually emitting more carbon than than you're sequestering. Uh, I'm assuming there's a lot of agriculture people in here that understand that the soil is really important. It's not just about the biomass of the plant. So if we're, if we're killing our soil in the process, we're not actually solving the problem. So that has to be a really important factor in this too. So we can solve this at scale while supporting and rebuilding the small farmer um, community and incentivizing our agricultural industry to sequester the carbon for us and then store it in their building and meet the affordable housing uh, crisis that we're in there right now as well. And with that comes natural skins. You know, the high performance uh, now, uh, the high performance construction industry for years has been pushing for um, membranes and foams and sealants and tapes and plastics um, to achieve air tightness, thermal performance, and moisture management uh, properties. Where clay, for example, is a fantastic natural material that achieves uh, at least two of those air tightness, and mo amazing moisture management. There are natural skins that don't require uh, the use of a peel and stick roll of membrane. Uh, it's, it's just not needed. So there's ways to apply a natural skin uh, at scale using pump sprayer system, you know, get a few people behind. So we've, we've done that. We have uh, the systems and processes and the people in our network at least, not, not my company. I'm just helping bring people together and, and, and make it happen to execute projects. Um, but there are sprayers and teams in our community and, and around the country now that can apply natural materials uh, at a very cost, uh, cost effective competitive edge to drywall and latex paint. Um, and it's beautiful, it's fun. It's biophilic, it's healthy. It physically cleans the air passively through the ionization of the water molecules. That's a nerdy science thing about clay. Um, if you have questions that, you know, reach out and ask about that. It's really cool. Um, yeah, lime is great for exterior. Clay is great for interior. So from that, I want to do a little overview before we get into, before we wrap up and, and have a discussion and questions. I started with identifying my bleeding heart. What's, what are, in your industry, in the work that you're doing in the world right now, what does your heart bleed for? What are the problems that you've identified that you just can't take your attention away? You can't stop thinking about that thing within the industry, within that process. Identify those, whether it's one or many, just become aware, more and more aware of them and learn more about them. Be willing to work for different forms of capital. This was a big one. I spent a lot of time 
um, volunteering every extra moment I could. I was working really hard so that I could have the basics in life, small apartment, food, uh, gas for my car, insurance, things like that. Um, you know, and I know this is a privilege thing. Like, I, I, I get it. I'm able-bodied. Uh, I was able to do that. I grew up in a, a, a family that was really, you know, motivational and hardworking with, with certain levels of ethics that I know a lot of people did not grow up in. So I have uh, that kind of privilege. Um, three older brothers that, you know, whipped me into shape whenever they needed to. And it wasn't always easy, but um, crafted me into a hardworking person. So I know I have these certain forms of privileges where I can work for different forms of capital, but even small, small bits, everyone can, whether it's helping a friend out um, or, you know, anyway, if you're interested in that topic, eight forms of capital, just Google that. So great study. Find your mentors. Who are the people who have been doing this? Who are the people that, I think most importantly, I think um, some of our communities around here need to hear this the most. Who are the people that disagree with you? Who are the people that have different opinions? What if you sought them out and just shut up and, shut up and listen and seek to understand where they're coming from? So that just for the sake of expanding your understanding, period, you could just listen and seek to understand the people that have different opinions and people that disagree with, with our narrative, whatever that is. So I encourage you to expand that if, 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 that, feels, if that feels right for you. Um, yeah. Find the people, connect, offer help, find out, be of service. And when you find people that are doing the same work as you or want to uh, do the same things or, or have the same vision, for example, or have a similar vision, don't assume competition. Look for symbiosis. There is no shortage of demand for good work. And I'm not just talking building or, or, or anything. This applies, I think it applies to everything we do. See, find the symbiosis and see if there's ways to work together. You don't have to get married to this person. I mean that from a business standpoint. You don't have to join uh, the same legal entity or you know, sign, uh, you know, mutual, you, you can just be in collaboration and sit down and have tea and share ideas and share insights. And I know that can be scary because, you, you know, a narrative, a background narrative can, can be, oh, you're building the competition, you're helping the competition, you're, you might be creating competition. I have not found that to be true. And I've done a lot of that. In, in my eight years of doing this, about nine. I, yeah, so far that's not been true. And if you do create competition, great. Because if, if the work you're doing is for the right reasons and you feel good about that and you're in integrity and in that in alignment with that, then great, create competition, create more people, help, help the people that are also on that same mission. If that's a problem for you, uh, please question what you're doing and more importantly, why, why you're doing it in the first place. You should be able to create competition. And another, and a bonus thing is let death happen. You don't have to, you know, I'd say, give it a shot, give, give opportunity a shot. And when, for example, you know, there's people on your team that are, not in alignment anymore or having uh, they're not integrity. They're bringing things to the table that are counterproductive, directly opposed to the agreed 
uh, mission, direction, values, et cetera, of your group, of your organization, of your mission. It's okay to trim branches when they need to, when, when those branches are no longer uh, healthy or serving the tree. It's okay to let, to trim branches and let death happen. That applies to visions, that applies to expectations, that applies to goals. Uh, be adaptive, let change happen. Yeah, find your partnerships. This is a global network of people doing good work. And I know that that's not just true for the building industry or, or design and architecture. There's, there's people that, there's a lot of people. We're virtual, connect, reach out. Because the more we do that, um, the more interconnected and, and widespread that what your web can be, the more resilient your local place becomes. That's what I find. I'd love to get into discussions. What time is it? Oh, wow, it's late. That was much longer than I thought. Okay, I'm here. Um, please reach out with any questions that if, if we don't get into anything here, take a screenshot if you, if you want of that. Get my name, number. Thank you so much for letting me be here and, and talking about this important topic, my passion, my story, sharing with an awesome community of greeners here. I'm stoked to, to be reconnecting with Evergreen and 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 still in this community. I'm 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 here in Olympia. Um come hang out, come reach out, come, you know, invite me to tea. Get to you know, I love meeting with people. I love hearing the visions and offering insights and perspectives and resources and connections. With that, I uh, will close. Thank you so much, Aaron. <clears throat> um, before, um, do you have time to take a couple questions or do you have to hop off? No worries. I have, I have time. Okay, I awesome. Thank you so much. Before, um, there's there's quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll read those off. Before I do, if we can all take a moment, um, you know, either unmuting, our, or unmuting ourselves or using the emojis or in the chat. Thank you so much for um, spending such wonderful time with us, Aaron, and sharing such um awesome work and wisdom um so so appreciate so just a moment of, of thanks from everyone first question we had was how do you create leaky buildings that are energy efficient not sure if you need clarification on that one oh i can make this brief i don't think you can um so leaky is not the way to go we need to create airtight buildings and control the ventilation, um, ideally through a heat exchanger system. So for more information on that, Google ERV uh, or HRV. Um, an ERV, if that's not clear if the sound is, it's Echo Romeo uh, Victor, ERV. Uh, it's energy recovery ventilation system. And it's a great system. We, we, put it, we put that in all of our buildings. It controls the ventilation. There's a fan pushing air out. There's a fan pushing air in. It crosses it all basically through just a simple radiator. Captures about 90 something percent of the heat before it leaves, transfers it into the incoming air, and then distributes it to all of its living spaces. So you can exchange the, all the air, the volume of air in the house every few hours. Um, it's very quiet. It's very, very efficient. Um, and that makes it so that the heat input that's required in that building is very, very small. Some of the high performance passive house buildings show that a tea kettle in the morning is enough to keep the house warm throughout the entire, for the next 24 hours. So you don't actually need these big heating systems and cooling systems if you build your house right in the first place. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next question is just a clarification. Um, what was the name of that design software that you used? Yeah, uh, I'll put in the chat. It's Autodesk's Revit, R-E-V-I-T. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. I'm from a lower socioeconomic status. I see that a lot of homes that are over 30 years old um, what are some ways you can think to show that sustainability is important when looking to update their homes with your kind of business? Yeah, retrofits are really tricky, especially for these older homes um, on tight budgets. Um, it's something that is 
I wish I had all the answers to this. Um, there, this is where I think policy and funding is making um, our public funding systems and, and, and mechanisms are making some progress in this area, but have a long, long way to go. I think there's a lot of push. For, I mean, there, there are systems and processes to fund heat pumps, uh, you know, different systems like this for low income families. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot more we can be doing. If you're, if you have to take your siding off for any reason, that's the best, most cost-effective way to then add these other layers, um, wrap it in an exterior insulation and put a good airtight membrane around that. So basically, uh, give it a jacket with a good windbreaker. That would be the most cost-effective thing you can do if you have to take your siding off already. If you don't, then you just have to add that cost in there. Oh, well, okay, you know, to then add, take off the siding just to do this important thing, then install new siding. But if you already have to do that, that's the most of the cost. So adding a jacket, a fluffy jacket with a windbreaker, um, maybe some, you know, at least double pane windows um, and install them right and really focus on air tightness. Um, that's a way to go. Getting rid of uh, inefficient heating and cooling systems. If you have a, an old oil or gas boiler, you know, don't. Um, there are programs that provide some significant rebates, especially for low-income families, um, for upgrading their inefficient energy systems. So reach out if you have more specific questions about that. I'd be happy to, to share resources on that, connect you with people who do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Do you use environmental testing for lead paint, et cetera? <clears throat> um, we do. I mean, the one time I had to deal with this, I hired this out. Um, and I wasn't even the one responsible for doing that part of it. So I can't really speak directly to that. Um, you mean if, do you mean if we have to come in and do a retrofit renovation or fix something up and see if it has lead paint. So from, from what I've been told, um, best practice, if you suspect lead paint and you don't have to remove it, don't. Just leave it, don't disturb it, because it's not a problem unless you grind it into dust and it's airborne, um, or you flake it, you know, unless you turn it into an airborne particle, it's not actually a problem to so like, don't use it in the first place. And if it's already there, then don't disturb it. If those are not options, then remove it uh, responsibly with the right PPE. Cert, like, and, and just, you know, if you don't have to do it yourself, don't. There are, there are companies that do that kind of work um, that are certified in, in uh, hazardous waste removal. That, that, that's one of them. I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question, do you use sustainable dyes for color, et cetera? And are there any grants or special construction loans available to build your homes? And there's also just a follow-up question that I wanted to lift up that this was the best presentation this quarter and there are lots of things in the chat. No way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, uh, there are some great sources of natural mineral, mineral pigments. We try our best to use, um, we, we start by using mineral pigments. If, if we can't achieve the color, if a client's just like adamantly, like we really want this bright, vibrant, obnoxious color, and we can't achieve that with natural mineral pigments. And that's like iron oxide. Um, there's lots of, you know, titanium oxide things. There's, and there's still, you know, I, I wouldn't call them, non-toxic. They're definitely, you do not want to breathe them. Um, they could even cause some skin irritation, but they're at least naturally occurring mineral pigments that are very, you know, anyway, there's great sources to this and, and it is a little tricky. Um, a simple way to go uh, is there are some zero VOC, rel relatively healthy 
um, paint pigments that you can get. And you can, yeah, you can dye, um, you can dye plaster in any color. We've been starting to play with beet juice and onion peel and different food waste and food sources of, of dyes. Um, and I really, especially my partner, she's really into this. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions or insights or wants to experiment with that, please let me know. Or we have just a few more walls to plaster in our house uh, and would be so down to experiment with that. That's a pretty cool offer. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. A couple other questions. Do you have any, or do you have good ventilation solutions for radon? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of a few good um, under slab or, or membrane, good membranes that handle radon pretty well. Um, we try to specify those when possible. Um, we always talk about and address radon control under slabs. If anyone doesn't know what that is, it's a, it's a gas that um, is emitted from the earth underneath concrete. Um, and if you trap it and it seeps up through the cracks in concrete, it, it can be quite hazardous for human health. Um, not my area of expertise. I don't have that much understanding beyond that. I just know that it's something to, to manage and mitigate. Um, I don't want to have the, that membrane, the name of that membrane off the top of my head, but if you Google what I would, you know, where I would go to find that is to Google uh, radon control membrane or radon um, detailing under slab or crawl space, whatever you're looking at. Awesome, thanks. Um, another clarification, what was the UW, UW Carbon Leadership Organization? Yeah, Carbon Leadership Forum. Did you just Google that? Um, Carbon Leadership Forum. Uh, that's a great organization out of UW. Awesome. And then I'm going to combine the last two that I have right now in the chat. Um, because yeah, just because, um, so do you prefer to design single story or multi-story residential and do you use Tyvek? We do not use Tyvek ever, ever, ever. Um, I, I, at the risk of, uh, not being sued, I will not say anything more than that. Uh, but we do not and will never use Tyvek again. Um, I believe I can legally say that. There's, that's fine. Um, I live in a neighborhood. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. The other question was, do you prefer to design single story or multi-story ah, residential? Thanks. Um, so depends. Whenever we can. So like, you know, when you learn in biology, there's a uh, there's a nice, there's a sweet spot ratio of volume per square foot. Uh, volume to square foot ratio. And I remember learning that the size of a cell is like a human cell is optimally sized for to maximize the area, the, the surface area to volume ratio. Um, different shapes of 3D objects have different ratios. Ideally, so the most expensive part of a building is the exterior surface area. If you have a long, skinny, uh, you know, short, flat rectangle, for example, or any other shape, but it's long and skinny, has a lot of surface area, big perimeter, but not that much volume, that's not, um, that's not a cost-effective way to go. Uh, on, the flip, on the flip side, a perfect cube, for example, or a perfect sphere or dome um, that has that seeks to minimize the square foot surface area, or yeah, minimize the surface area and maximize the square foot would be uh, a good way to go. So finding the right balance that meets the design program and sets of needs um, is fine. So so in in, in essence. Yeah, building up is a, is a good way to go. There's 
uh, there are some downsides to that. It does complicate um, engineering a bit, but we do a lot of two-story two-story houses, and and it, and it is a really good way to go. Um, yeah, floors, floating floor systems, second floor systems are are not hard to do, and not. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good way to add square foot, you know, add usable space to the building at the lowest cost possible. So yeah. Awesome. And I think I think this will be the very last question if you're okay with taking one more. Totally. Um, UW buildings aiming to reduce embodied carbon are very expensive. Is this a coincidence or should I look into it further? This is not a coincidence. Um, and yes, look into it further. I'll say this. Um, you know, when we look at, you know, I think passive house, the passive house movement, uh, I'll start on the, the flip side of this. The passive house movement um, is recently, in the last couple of years, getting more on board with carbon, embodied carbon. But traditionally, they've been very focused on operational co uh, carbon, energy efficiency, uh, air tightness, thermal performance, things of this nature. Um, at the expense of embodied carbon, or the expense of toxicity of the materials themselves, or just while emitting those things. Um, and they're finally coming around and, and incorporating those important topics. On the flip side, um, if you just focus on uh, embodied carbon, uh, it's, it, there's a fine line between. I'll just, I'll just go right to the middle of this. Natural building systems can be very expensive, but they don't have to be. In order for them to be accessible, and there's not many, I mean, there are quite a few natural builders that are charging a lot of money for what they're doing um, before they even do a lot of, before they bring in art. Um, yeah. There's intelligent, there's, there's, efficient, there's efficient ways and there's inefficient ways to use natural materials in buildings. And this is where I think panelization, this is where uh, developing systems that scales up the process that makes it um, a little bit faster to do is I think where we meet that sweet spot and where we, where we achieve energy efficiency and embodied carbon and at a cost effective, um, accessible economic price point. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron, for staying on and answering all these uh, wonderful questions. So one more time, thank you. Let's give a big round of applause and hearty thanks uh, to Aaron for spending um, his time with us this afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>